for that really enlightening introduction. Um, I've been asked to speak about type 1a supernovae, dark energy, and the Hubble constant. And of course, uh, as was just explained, uh, Lemaitre had a, a huge influence on early cosmology. And let me just show you the introduction to the Wikipedia article on him, where it says many of the things that Helga essentially told us right now. He proposed the theory of the expansion of the universe, widely misattributed to Edwin Hubble. Uh, he was the first to derive what is now known as Hubble's law and made the first estimation of what is called the Hubble's constant, which he published in 1927, and the originator of the Big Bang model as the primeval atom. So Edwin Hubble, of course, gets most of the credit. It's interesting that half of his data were actually published by Vesto Slifer. The redshifts came from Slifer's work. Hubble did not reference Slifer's work. However, to be fair, Lemaitre didn't reference Slifer's work either. And so the, the huge unsung hero, in my opinion, in early day cosmology was, was Vesto Slifer, who really does not get nearly the evidence, the, the uh, credit that he deserves. Um, by the way, Slifer in 1917 already had 24 or 25 of the red shifts, four of which I think were blue shifts. By 1922, he had 41 of them, uh, which he privately circulated. Arthur Eddington, in a book, published those 41. Um, Slifer was loath, in some cases, to publish, as was uh, Lemaitre. But anyway, okay, so here's the low redshift Hubble diagram. Velocity is proportional to um, distance, okay? The theorist's view is something like this. In an empty universe with nothing to slow it down, the scale factor increases linearly with time. But of course, in a very dense universe, it expands for a while and then collapses. A medium density universe is the critical one where it expands forever, just barely. And most observations through the early 1990s suggested that we live in a low density universe with an omega matter of around 0.3 or so. Well, one can look back into the history of the universe to see what it used to be doing and thus to predict the future. Um, looking back at the first part of this diagram and understanding, of course, the definition of redshift, one plus the redshift is the scale factor. At the time that the photons you are now seeing were emitted, divided, I'm sorry, now, divided by the scale factor at the time the photons you are now seeing were emitted. So, for example, redshift one corresponds to a universe which, at the time the photons you are now seeing were emitted, was half of its present size. And you can see that the look back times for a given redshift depend on the cosmological model. In the dense universe, the look back time is smallest. In a less dense universe, it's bigger. In an empty universe, it's bigger still, all right? So the observer's job is to measure the redshifts and independently the distances, not using the redshift, that would be not be fair, but independently get the distances of galaxies and plot the distance versus redshift relation. So here you see what an observer would try to measure. At low redshifts, of course, everyone gets the linear Hubble law, but at higher redshifts, for a given redshift, the dense universe has the smallest distance, the empty universe has the biggest distance, all right? So that's the idea. Well, you need redshifts and you need distances. How do you do that? For nearby, well, for galaxies, it's reasonably easy to get the redshifts. You just measure from the galaxy spectrum. It might take a while with a big telescope for a faint galaxy, but at least you can do it pretty easily. Distances, of course, in astronomy has al have always been harder to determine. Um, you can define various forms of distance, angular diameter, luminosity distance, they all work out the same as long as you maintain self-consistency. What I'll be using is luminosity distances, the distances that you get assuming an inverse square law of light. You measure the flux, you have to somehow know the luminosity L. That's the part that's hard. We use what we call standard candles. I don't like that term. There is no such thing as a standard candle. Even the famous Cepheid variables are standardizable candles. They have a period luminosity relationship. The more luminous Cepheid variables have longer periods of pulsation than the less luminous ones. So they're standardizable candles. 
Don't know where the term standard candle came from, but I don't like it. Anyway, Edwin Hubble could use the Cepheids in nearby galaxies in the 1920s, and indeed, this is how he settled the debate of the spiral nebulae, whether they're galactic or extragalactic. There's a famous picture of, of a variable star, a Cepheid variable that Hubble discovered in the Andromeda galaxy. But what about these fuzzy little blobs? You're not going to see Cepheid variables in them. They're billions of light years away. So we use type 1a supernovae that can reach a brilliance of 4 billion solar luminosities. The type 1a's are the ones that don't have hydrogen. They have a very distinct spectrum, and often the silicon line is used to identify them. But they're really quite easily distinguished from the type 2s, which do have hydrogen and which come from massive red supergiants. The 1As come up from a white dwarf, which reaches or gets close to the Chandrasekhar limit, either through accretion from a more or less normal companion star, or perhaps by the merging of two white dwarfs. And probably both channels lead to type 1As, maybe even directly colliding white dwarfs do. They're not standard, nor are the Cepheids, but they are standardizable through a relationship first articulated quite convincingly by Mark Phillips and then um, refined in greater detail by Adam Reese and his team under the direction of Har Bob Kirshner and Mario Amui, Mark Phillips, Nick Sunsef, who's here, and, and their collaborators. The more luminous type 1As are those that have slower light curves. This was first defined by the decline rate, but it turns out to be true for the rise rate as well. And this was established using supernovae 1A in galaxies whose distances have been measured by Cepheid variables or whatnot. Okay, so you define this relationship through type 1As in galaxies whose distances you know, and then you can apply this relationship to a set of type 1As in galaxies whose distance you don't know. You also measure the colors in order to determine the reddening, the extinction, the setting sun effect. It not only looks dimmer, but it looks redder as well. And in particular, I'm most familiar with Adam Reese's multicolor light curve shape method because after finishing his doctoral work with Bob Kirshner at Harvard, he came to Berkeley as a postdoc to work with me, and that's where he did most of the work on the high z uh, supernova search team. So here you see uh, the dispersion in the Hubble diagram that you get when you assume that type 1As are a standard candle versus what you get, a factor of three improvement when you apply the multicolor light curve shape method. It is this that allowed type 1As to become serious cosmological candles, okay? This type of improvement. All right, so we've determined the true peak luminosity of a type 1A. Now let's go and find them in distant galaxies. How do you do that? Well, you form teams. The first team to have formed was Saul Perlmutter's Supernova Cosmology Project at Berkeley. And then Brian Schmidt and Nick Sunseth. Nick is here, actually. He'll be speaking later on on the Observer's Universe, formed, co-formed the High z team. And uh, contrary to popular belief, Saul and Brian and Nick were not always at each other's throats. It was actually generally a healthy competition. Both wanted to be first. This accelerated progress in the field, in the field, pun intended. Both wanted to be best, so if one team was taking some subtle effect into account, the other team was not, then that first team would look bad by comparison. And frankly, had there not been two teams that came up with the result, hardly anyone would have believed us. All right, so it was good to have those two teams. The data were taken largely at Saratololo, where new wide field cameras would give pictures roughly the size of the full moon where you'd get in a single picture a thousand or more galaxies. If you take a bunch of such pictures, say 50 over the course of a couple of nights, then repeat the process a few weeks later and digitally subtract the old images from the new images, you would find a few, maybe a dozen or so, uh, supernova candidates because out of 50 or 100,000 galaxies, even for a 1A rate of one per galaxy per, say, 500 years, you'd still get lots of them the batch technique, which uh, Saul's group actually showed quite effectively. My job on the two teams, I was actually the only person to have been at one point or another a member of both teams. Uh, my job was to get spectra of the supernova candidates, 
to determine whether they're 1As and to get the redshifts of the galaxies in which they occurred. And that's because I had access to the twin Keck 10 meter telescopes on Mauna Kea volcano in Hawaii. And data like this made us happy because this was a clear type 1A. This feature in particular is due to single ionized silicon. It does not appear in type 2s or 1Bs, 1Cs, or the other types of possible supernovae. Compared to a low redshift 1A, you can see here the match is very, very good. So here are three of the objects that the high z team, the schmidt sunsef team, found, and for which we got spectra. And the point is, they're faint. They're very, very faint. And you might say, well, that's fine. They're in these scrawny, pathetic-looking galaxies here. You don't even see the galaxy. Obviously, these are distant type 1As. But the point is, they're fainter and more distant than you expected in any well-behaved universe. Remember, here are the choices on the multiple choice exam. And the answer was none of the above. Those, that dashed line is where the data fell, surprising the heck out of both teams. All right? If this is omega matter greater than 1, 1 1.3 and 0, then obviously this is omega matter less than 0, right? But we know of no such substance, matter with a negative, that is gravitational repulsion. However, we did know of something due to Einstein in 1917, and as Helga said, res resuscitated quite a bit by Georges Lemaitre. Uh, the cosmological constant, which Einstein first introduced to have a static universe and then renounced after Hubble discovered the expansion because the whole physical and philosophical basis for this crazy ad hoc fudge factor disappeared. Well, let's call it then lambda greater than zero rather than some sort of a repulsive actual matter. The cosmological constant, of course, is a vacuum energy with a positive energy density, but what causes the repulsion is the negative pressure, which overwhelms the gravitationally attractive positive energy density. Here are the data in the first papers that were published. Uh, the einstein de Sitter universe is this dashed line, normalized to the dashed line. You can see the data points are well above that even normalized to the expected low density universe, uh, the points were somewhat higher. And you know, the statistical significance does not exactly overwhelm you. This is not a five sigma LHC type result, but we've got one universe to deal with. We only have a few dozen supernovae. It would take years to get more of them. At some point, you have to publish. And so both teams did. Um, by the way, here are the contours in the omega lambda omega matter plane. Yes, you could have an omega lambda zero universe, but 97% of the area of these contours lies above the lambda equals zero curve. So this suggested a non-zero cosmological constant, which we now, of course, more generically call dark energy. Here are the two papers, the high Z team paper published in 1998, September, submitted actually in March of 98, and then Saul's paper published in June of 1999, submitted in September of 98. Meanwhile, other people were doing other research, okay, that was certainly very useful. Large-scale surveys of galaxies, the two-degree field galaxy redshift survey, Sloan and others suggested, continued to suggest matter densities of 0.3. That result was not going away. The boomerang results, however, in late 90s, around 2000, 99, 2000, suggested a flat universe. The observed fluctuations in the microwave background matched in size scale and power spectrum those expected in a flat universe, not bigger as in a closed universe nor smaller as in a hyperbolic negatively curved universe. So here are the constraints provided by the CMB. To a first approximation, you measure the geometry of the universe, essentially whether the sum of the interior angles of a gigantic triangle are or are not 180 degrees. The supernovae are measuring not the sum of the densities, but more of the difference, how much is matter pulling versus how much is repulsive stuff pushing. All right? And then large-scale structure gave an omega matter point three universe largely independent of the cosmological constant. 
all three merge right there. The concordance model started emerging, and of course, with the WMAP1, 3, 5, 7, 9 results, the microwave background constraints became progressively better. The supernova results became progressively wet better as well. Here's the 2004 diagram. I'm giving you kind of a chronological history here. By 2004, here are the one sigma uncertainties, well above any sort of a lambda equals zero line, even at three sigma, well above lambda equals zero line. So the data were getting much, much better at this point. Supernovae 1A plus large scale structure gave this result essentially the same as CMB plus large scale structure. What this means is by the mid 2000s, you could throw out any, of, any single technique that you didn't like for whatever reason. You don't believe the 1As or you don't believe large scale structure or you don't believe the microwave background. I don't care. Throw out any one method, the others still agree. That's what we mean by the concordance model. Well, if it is lambda, the universe should have decelerated and Helga showed you a version of this uh, the Metz version had a much longer hibernating phase that allowed him to reconcile the observed ages of the stars with the expansion age of the universe. But in any case, if this is something like the cosmological constant, then early on when the matter density of the universe dominated, the universe should have been decelerating and only later started accelerating. So if you go to much higher redshifts, you sh should start seeing the supernovae not look too faint fainter than expected, but in a sense brighter than expected. And so under the leadership of Adam Reese, we far formed the higher redshift supernova search team and we measured the type 1As and indeed at very high redshifts, they start following a curve that looks like Einstein to Zitter because that's what the universe was early on, okay? And pure acceleration could be ruled out. So this is where we were by 2007 or so. As uh, Helga mentioned, uh, Lemaitre retained the cosmological constant after Einstein and de Zitter had abandoned it, and, Einstein and uh, Lemaitre uh, still very much favored the cosmological constant. Among other things, this helped reconcile the expansion age of the universe with the ages of the, of the stars. Other evidence for some sort of a repulsive energy started coming in. You start with the microwave background fluctuations, let gravity, that great sculptor of the universe, take over. You form large scale structure. The computer simulations gave results using pure gravity that looked almost, but not quite, like the observed large scale structure. But when you add some repulsive dark energy, then by redshift zero, you get an observed, yeah, a theoretical large scale structure that looks a lot like the observed large scale structure. And here's, of course, Springle's millennium simulation, indeed a simulation, but based on observations. And uh, the growth of large scale structure also then favored the presence of some sort of a repulsive component to the universe. So by around 2010 or so, here was the cosmic pie chart, very different from the chart that most of us my age and older grew up with when we were doing our undergraduate and graduate studies, when the chart was basically this, because back then a lot of people didn't pay attention to Zwicky's dark matter or Vera Rubin's or other people's dark matter either. So our universe was this, very different universe. By 2011, the evidence from some sort, for some sort of acceleration, some sort of a dark component had become so great that it was recognized with the Nobel Prize in Physics to Saul Perlmutter, Brian Schmidt, and Adam Rees. And um, these gentlemen, of course, understood that without the rest of us working hard in the trenches, the discovery would not have been recognized with the Nobel Prize. And so they spent part of their prize money flying the rest of us out. Here's the high Z team celebratory lunch at which uh, Noelle, my wife who's here, unveiled her consolation prize to all of us who did not win the Nobel Prize. A t-shirt, dark energy is the new black. She sent a copy to the king of Sweden, figuring that he did not have one yet since she basically uh, collected, I mean, she, she made it, she created it. Uh, the 2015 fundamental, the breakthrough prize in fundamental physics actually recognized all 50 people who had uh, participated in the in the discovery, so, you know, not sure what the Nobel is going to do about 
the LHC discovery of the Higgs. Anyway, dark energy seems to be real. So what is it? We move on to reconsidering the cosmological constant. Planck scale to the fourth power gives you an expected value of 10 to the 120, I believe 10 to the 122. But of course, there's no real reason even to cut off at the Planck scale. If you go down to zero size quantum fluctuations, you know, you get an infinite energy density for the vacuum. So this is a real problem, not good quantitative agreement with uh, theoretical expectations. The value of 0.7 is about the biggest difference from 10 to the 120th or even infinity that you can think of. So way too small and also why now? The value changes with time. Why are we living at a time when matter and this repulsive energy are roughly 50-50? So Steven Weinberg called it a bone in the throat. So people started thinking more seriously about a more generic form, which we call dark energy, defined by some equation of state parameter, W. Rho goes as volume to the minus one plus W power. Of course, W is zero for normal non-relativistic matter, one third for photons because their energy redshifts away. Negative one for lambda, right? Density is independent of the scale factor or the volume of the universe. Generically, not equal to negative one for a whole set of models called quintessence. There are others as well, but there's a whole class of them by this name, rolling scalar fields, etc. Cosmic strings, by the way, give you W of negative one third, highly ruled out by now. So gravitational acceleration is proportional to, of course, the Newtonian term minus rho c squared, but here's the relativity, 3p. So if W is minus one third or less, then the pressure dominates over the attractive energy density and you get acceleration. So that's what you need. So you want to measure this W thing. So a number of teams set out to measure it. The Supernova Legacy Survey, the Essence Survey. The differences in magnitude that you expect for different values of W, different from minus one, the null hypothesis, so to speak, are not big. This is one-tenth of a magnitude. Each tick mark is one one-hundredth of a magnitude. And so you have to go out you know, to reasonable redshifts and make really very accurate uh, measurements without systematic errors to try to distinguish W of minus one from something not minus one. But progress has been made, and here's one of the more recent um, compilations, the Sloan Digital si Sky Survey 2 plus the Supernova Leg Legacy Survey plus the various HST results and all that. And this is, in my opinion, just a thing of beauty. How far have we come from Hubble's 1929 diagram or Lundmark's 1974 diagram that Helga showed us where you could barely, if you were on some sort of a strange drug or something, maybe see a linear relationship there, but probably not. So we've come a long way. It's amazing. Again, uh, here's the joint analysis W omega matter using uh, now baryon acoustic oscillations, Planck data, and so on. Things are narrowing in pretty well now. Interestingly, much of the area lies formally at W values more negative than negative one, a phantom energy that actually increases in energy density with time, leading possibly to the big rip. I think most of us find that to be a rather repugnant idea, but the data do not rule it out right now. Here's another way of uh, looking at W, parameterize it as W of A is W naught plus W little a times one minus a, where a is the scale factor. So of course for lambda, W naught is minus one, W a is zero. And uh, here's from the Betul uh, paper, you know, minus one and zero work fine, but it's really hard to measure derivatives at this point still. The data are still not good enough, and so the error bars are still very, very large. We, need, we have a lot of work to do to determine derivatives of, uh, of um, W. Okay, but in any case, the data are right now perfectly consistent with the null hypothesis that the dark energy really is the cosmological constant or something, at least at this time, observationally indistinguishable from the cosmological constant. We have not ruled out something that someday turns into a big crunch, especially if this dark energy changes sign as the inflaton did long, long ago. But nor have we ruled out something like the Big Rip, interestingly enough. We still do not know how the universe will end. So the most recent surprise is uh, that the current rate of expansion still might be too high 
even taking into account the known acceleration with a dark energy that is the cosmological constant or something which is at this time indistinguishable from it. What do I mean by this? Well, go back now to the best existing measurements of the microwave background, the Planck 2015 paper. I don't know, Francois, is a new, a new analysis imminent? Not yet. Not yet, but we will, I'll be interested to hear what you say about what I'm sure you know I'm about to present because, you know, the results came out about a year ago, but now there's additional data. But anyway, these little freckles are just absolutely marvelously measured now. We think we understand the early universe. We think we understand this cosmic pie with lambda, dark matter, and a smidgen of normal matter. Uh, we think we have three neutrino species. We think we know the early universe quite well. So you can propagate this forward, uh, by the way, we think we know the early universe very well just because of the absolutely unbelievable fit that you get to the data. Um, I mean, this is just a thing of beauty and it's, our, it's not our fault, but it's unfortunate that we don't have many universes to look at. That's of course the origin of the large error bars down there. Uh, anyway, that's just a thing of beauty, I admit. But you take that all right, and you can define an angular diameter distance. I'm sorry, this I just copied and pasted it because using PowerPoint, it was just too difficult to make integral signs and all that. So uh, anyway, this is uh, one over one plus z star, where z star is the redshift of the CMB. You get an angular diameter from the roughly the sound um, crossing time versus the measured value of these uh, little things, and so this is. You know, H of Z is, is, um, uh, is in here. And so, you know, having measured this, you basically can figure out the Hubble constant now, all right? So you predict the current expansion rate from the measured size of the, you know, angular variations and from the known physical size of the distance sound waves could have traveled. And they get either 66.93 plus or minus 0.62 or 67.8 plus or minus 0.9. Which is it, Francois? I've seen it differently in different versions of the Astro PH paper. It depends. Yeah, which, that's right. What constraints you do believe or don't believe, but, well, yeah. But in any case, the numbers are around 67, 68 maximum with an astonishingly small error bar if you believe it, okay. Previous direct measurements, well, all right, 70 to 75, plus or minus 4.7, no big deal. These overlap quite easily, all right. So there's a possible conflict, but it's certainly not clear. Error bars are large and uncertain. Well, and even the Planck team themselves in section 5.4 said, CMB experiments provide indirect and highly model dependent estimates of the Hubble constant. It is therefore important to compare CMB estimates with direct estimates of H naught since any significant evidence of attention could indicate the need for new physics. Didn't have to wait till the 2015 paper to recognize this. Back in the early 2000s, again under the direction of Adam Rees, we found, formed a collaboration called SHOES. Um, the H naught is here and the equation of state is there. Anyway, there's a whole series of papers, okay, and the goal was to measure the current value of the Hubble constant to eventually plus or minus 1%. We hope to do that by 2022 using Gaia measurements of the parallaxes of Cepheid variables, okay. Latest results, we've gotten down to roughly 2.4%. This is a paper that came out in 2016, all right. How do we do it? Well, we're measuring the host galaxies of nearby type 1As. We do this for 19 host galaxies by measuring Cepheid variables that were found by the Hubble Space Telescope. We're in the process of, of determining the calibration of the Cepheids using a spatial scanning technique with the Hubble Space Telescope and later Gaia. So we're doing that step as well. But in any case, the paper focused on the 19 uh, host galaxies and then we use the low redshift ridge line for the type 1As. And we get 73.24 and we spent a long time 
trying to get our error bars to be small and to be well understood. That's the key. Small and well understood. Planck 68, roughly 3 sigma. I think it's 3.4 if you take this number here and it's only 2.5 if you take that number there. But anyway, 3 sigma. I'm not going to bet my life on it, but 2.5 to 3 sigma was the amount of confidence that both teams had in 1998 early 99 when we uh, announced the accelerating expansion of the universe and we, we turned out to be right on that, you know? So we have smaller uncertainties than before. We think we understand them very well. We're not certain. Anyway, here we are. Here's RIS 11. If Staff U reanalyzed RIS 11, was a bit more pessimistic. We happen to disagree with him on a number of technical issues, but whatever. We're still hanging out over here. All right, here's the Planck result right there. What can you do? Well, you could relax the constraints on flatness, delta omega k of minus 0.1. That doesn't get you to where you need to be. You could have an evolving dark energy equation of state. That doesn't quite get you to where you need to be. Even when you take amounts which are sort of at the limit of what we think W can differ from minus 1 by, most people would agree W is between minus 0.9 and minus 1.1. And that doesn't get you there. You could have more than three neutrino species. That gets you there quite easily. That's the key thing. Some sort of a sterile neutrino that doesn't mess up Big Bang nucleosynthesis, that would do it. New physics, possibly. Dark radiation. <coughs> Or an error in what we've done, an error in what the CMB people have done, either in data analysis or the technique or something, or new physics. GR wrong, weird dark matter. You need independent methods to overcome the systematics. And as most of you have heard, the newest method, a team with which I had no contact whatsoever, holy cow, H naught lenses in the Cosmo Grail's wellspring, a series of five papers where they measure time delays. Um, sorry, it went the wrong way. Using time delays for gravitationally lensed quasars. All right? They're fed by supermassive black holes. The accretion rate varies. The quasar changes in brightness. But the different path lengths give you different time delays. Those can be measured. If you understand the potential really, really well, then you can turn that overall thing into a size scale for the universe. Obviously, if, we're, if I'm a couple of feet away from George, the same geometry will lead to much smaller time delays than if I'm billions of light years away from George. So that's the idea. Length minus length is uh, uh, divided by C is a delta T. OK, they've done these three lenses. These are ongoing. And um, here's their result, 72.8 plus or minus 2.4, slightly less precise than ours. Okay agrees with ours, disagrees with Planck. Interesting. Completely different method. Has nothing to do with Cepheids, nothing to do with type 1As. We need more of this kind of stuff. So maybe something interesting is going on. All I can say is, stay tuned, right? Stay tuned. Just like we said, stay tuned in, in, uh, in 1998. Thank you very much for your attention.